So welcome everyone to tonight's uh, Zoom tour and talk of our current collective exhibition featuring the work of Ronnie Bookbinder, Jean Burdick, Dora Fitcher, Kyoko Miyabi, and Joseph Sweeney. Um, the exhibit, if you can make it in person, is up through November 6th. And you can see uh, all the work also on our website if you can't get down. I'll put a link uh, in the chat. So we are going to uh, go through the gallery and visit each uh, artist and they'll speak as we go. If you want to put questions for them, you can do it in the chat. It'll be uh, easier to, to field them that way. And uh, we are recording this, so we'll edit it and put it on our YouTube channel, which is, uh, if you just look for Cerulean Arts Gallery and Studio, or there'll also be a link on our website on the exhibition page. So I'm going to uh, spotlight Tina's camera. And the first artist we're going to visit is Jean Burdick. Hi, Jean. Hi. Uh, <laughs> you want to tell us about your, your exhibition? Sure. Uh, my name is Jean Burdick. I'd first like to thank Mike and Tina for the wonderful job they did installing my work in the gallery. And congratulations to all the other artists. And thank you for those of you who are here this evening. Um, I live in Bucks County, Yardley specifically, and I grew up in Lancaster County. And I have many memories of walking through the wooded rural la landscapes in both areas. And when I'm walking through the areas, I'm obviously photographing the imagery that I'm seeing, whether it's vegetation or trees, uh, looking at the shadows on the trails, um, also the seasons, the light of uh, the time of day that I'm there. And especially during these past, I don't know, two and a half, three years, however long we've been in this situation with the pandemic, I've spent a lot more time and ramped up those types of walks. Um, most of the work that I do is a combination about, of also silk screening and painting. And this particular one, you'll notice, has a sense of depth because I'm using a layered approach where underneath I'm using a silk screen paper to do some printing and I actually painted some of the images underneath, but the top layer is vellum, which is a plastic based paper, uh, it's translucent. And I like working with that layering effect to give the illusion of depth. Silk screening is basically flat. And so this allows me to create that, uh, you know, things, simple things like overlapping images, size of images, but the vellum really helps to kind of push back the background. Um, uh, so these are ones that are on paper supports. The next ones I think Tina's gonna be going to, these are cradled panels. So the larger work, I work on cradled panels and uh, these particular, the two larger panels, I was focusing more looking down on the trail at the shadows during the day. So it's my interpretation of the images that I see. Mm. Um, when I'm working with silk screening, it's not in a traditional fashion. I don't register my work. Instead, I have a number of screens. And in my mind, I'm almost collaging with the screens to create the either the background pattern or the images that I'm going to overlay on top. The one in the middle is actually does not have vellum on it. It's just basically on the silk screen paper. Um, these, some of the parks that I've walked in are Tyler State Park, which is in Newtown, Pennsylvania. So these were some of the photographs that I used from the images. And you'll see some of them repeated in some other prints as we go around in the gallery. Uh, this is the other one that's on cradled panels. Again, thinking about uh, shadows that are on the trail. I don't use silk screening inks. Instead, I use my own acrylic paint with a silk screen modifier so that I can create the own, my own colors that I want to use for each one. Uh, the next two coming up are also some panels. Um, actually, the, the other and the four of those are panels. The one in the middle is done directly onto silk screening paper. Um, for me, walking in the same areas I've walked many times 
I was really focusing more on the smaller details. And for me, it's almost a type of escape from <laughs> the news of the day, whether it be politics, whether it's about the changing environment, whether it's about the pandemic, these types of walks gave me that ability to escape from that and use those images in my work. Um, sometimes I also enhance the images like this particular one, there are some drawn elements in there that I might add a little bit later on. And um, th so this one is a little bit, again, like the other one, a little bit different because it's directly on the back of the surface. So being surrounded by nature has always been a form of interpretation for me in my artwork. Um, merging images from several different perspectives also gives me a different feeling of trying to translate what I've experienced in these walks. On this particular one, the, um, the buds that you're seeing are actually, they were printed separately and then I collaged them back onto the surface of the cradled panel. Jean, how have you come to work in this layered mixed uh, process? Where did you, you know, did you mean how did I? Uh, yeah, how did you, did you, were you trained in this or did you come to well, it? Well, okay. I, I had, when I went to Pratt, I took printmaking as well as I was a painting major, but I also did printmaking. But I didn't do a lot with silk screening. When I went back for my MFA at UArts, I started working a little bit with silk screening and starting, you know, tearing things up, collaging it together with some drawn images with charcoal. And then later I just started <laughs> working with the, uh, with the painting and the silk screening together. So it kind of evolved over a period of time. And I think I must have seen some work on vellum, maybe like ink on vellum. These are all, these four that you're seeing here all have that vellum surface with it. And I, so I started experimenting with it and seeing what it was like. And I really liked the idea of screening um, on top of it so that it would push back the imagery which is underneath. So this particular one has a painting underneath of the leaves and then the vellum with the silk screen is on top. Okay, on this particular one, I was thinking obviously with the coloration, thinking about the fog, heading into winter. And in the background, the um, different patterns that I use are ones that I've created over time, whether it was from photographing the uh, patterns on uh, with gravel or actually even lava flows. <laughs> I've photographed some images for that that I've used for the, by the backgrounds that I use. So do you have to plan these carefully ahead of time or are you making decisions like as you work? I'm uh, making them? decisions as I go along. So um, even though I've created the photo silk screen of certain, and the photo silk screens I use are actually fairly small. So I kind of piece things together, but I have a feel for a, an overall photograph I've taken of a landscape area that I want to project as I start working. But they, of course like they evolve as you go along so I might have trees that were from um, a burn area in Glacier National Park that I had from years ago and combine it with some different uh, dried weeds that I saw in Core Creek State Park or Core Creek County Park which is in Langhorne Pennsylvania You know, the series that I was working on the past, I guess, two or three years were on facades, which I enjoyed working with, looking at the architecture, uh, doorways and windows kind of fascinated me, the different, uh, the idea of peering through windows. But then I guess with the pandemic, I was doing more um, staying local, doing more walking, hiking. And so I turned my attention back into the images of which I've worked with before of the natural world. Well, thank you, Jean.
And uh, next we have Joe Sweeney. This series is all nocturnes, correct? Right, right. So most most of the stuff that I do the, uh, is outdoor plein air stuff. So I'm usually out in the middle of the day and it's uh, bright and sunny and I've noticed that I was skipping over a certain amount of work that I hadn't touched for a while, uh, but I always had an interest in it. So I went and said, well, let's pull some of these things out that I ha I've had. Some of these are um, the original of these would have been uh, the idea would have been started about 50 years ago and then just pulled out little bits and pieces of ideas, old photographs old drawings, some sketches, and put together this show that has mostly to do with low light situations, sunset, uh, midnight, um, anything that has just that uh, moonlight kind of a, uh, effect. Some of these places like this little lighthouse here on the, on the left is from Newport, Rhode Island. And, um, it's called Castle Hill Light, and it's like one of the last things you would see when you leave the harbor. And I got that just as the sun is setting. So the light comes on, it's red, and it's also, if you notice, the back ha half of that is black because the guy who let them build the lighthouse there, his house was right behind it, and he didn't want the light shining in his bedroom window. So he said, if you just black out the back of this, uh, you can build the lighthouse there. So it was the Coast Guard that came along and asked them to do that so that they'd have a light to let mariners get into the harbor. And so uh, I was stationed in Newport for two years back in the day. So that was uh, part of that. This is down Cape May, New Jersey, um, out walking around at night and taking a look at the lighthouse back there with the moonlight coming through the clouds. And I thought, well, I'll have to work something out like that at some point. And, um, this one's down, a lot of these are, are travels. This one's down in uh, Key West. And I was out there painting again, too late in the day and had to, so the sun just clipped the top of that cloud as it was going down. And I had a few minutes to get that one together, but. Um, so are you was, working from uh, on the spot and photograph or both? That one was on the spot. Uh, a couple of these others are photographs. Um, there's a little version. There's a the big painting in the middle uh, is Bermuda. It's offshore. Let's see. Let's go to yeah. So when you're anchored out, sometimes one of the peaceful parts of the night is just to be able to sit there and look out from the boat. There's nothing, not much going on. Very quiet, but you've got some nice light and some nice color there. And this is a part where you can. There's a little bit of the blue in the sky there because as the light dims, as the sun drops below the horizon and it starts to get dimmer and dimmer, you also get less color. You, you don't see as much color. This is Hamilton Harbor in Bermuda. And so we're at that blue period just before everything starts to go gray. You're losing most of the light from the sky. Um, when the moon is out, you will get a little bit better light at that point, but if it's not out and the sun's going the other way, what will happen is later in the day, you'll just lose the light and everything turns uh, gray, black and white, gray, whatever's going on out there. So um, you're very attuned to the landscape. Yes, sir. So what is it about the landscape that draws you as an artist? Uh, I think as the beginning of my out, <laughs> out of high school life, I was a navigator uh, on a destroyer for two years. And a lot of that had to do with the world, the globe, the space, where you are, where your location is, how to get there, how to get back without uh, killing yourself. And uh, a lot of this is related to that. I mean, this this part here with the boats in Ireland, there's a, sun, uh, a moonlight with um, boats in Galway Harbor there. And it's a, cer it's a certain type of boat uh, that they build up there. And it has a kind of a, a very triangular looking shape. That little guy right there is my rendition of Brendan the Navigator, who they think in Ireland in the 400 or 500, 
uh, sailed across the Atlantic into Newfoundland and back again. And the the navigation when you're uh, when you're at sea, you have to write everything down. At least they did then wrote everything in a logbook so that you knew how far you went out so that you could replace that or retrace that to get back. And this was written in Latin, and most people considered it to be a fairy tale, but they retraced it. National Geographic did a, a whole thing on it in, the, in uh, 1976, and they found out that everything that they said in the book, if you left Ireland, went to the Faroe Islands, went to Iceland, went to Greenland, the time it took to sail there was exactly what they had in the book. So they think it might have actually been true. So I thought, well, I'll do a little painting on that and see how that goes. Just a little eight by 10. This one, there's another one in Newport Harbor. This place is called uh, Clingstone, but it's uh, the rocks themselves are called the dumplings. And this house was built by Joseph Wharton of the Wharton School and those people up in Newport. And uh, the reason he built his house there is because he had his house back there on the land and the army came along and said, we need that land. And so we're condemning your house. So you have to get out. And so he built, he bought the dumplings and built his house out there so that they wouldn't bother him again. And he lived there until he died in the 20s. And there's old, good old Roxborough when you're traveling around at night. You got to get a better, that, that, the, the light on this is not good at this point, but at some point, if you can twist the camera a little bit and just get it to look darker, uh, that'll look more interesting. Yeah, but, it's um, tricky. Yeah, it's, 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 the, it's the, always the, better to see them in person. Yeah, that's there. We are. We're we're about we're about the right light, except there's still the. You'll notice though when you have dark paintings like this, they're a nightmare to photograph to get the lights just right to get everything to look good because uh in person they work in the camera <laughs> it doesn't always work so there's uh ocean city that's the um uh lifeguard station or sometimes it's called the uh first aid station and those two little flags there are hurricane flags so when you have a, a two red flags with a black square in the middle that means hurricane so time to move on don't stand around there. Uh, any any questions about any of this stuff? So, and um, the bigger ones are, are oils. Some of the smaller ones are the slow drying acrylic that I've been playing with because it's easier to take those on the airplane. If you're going to Ireland, the, the work will dry in a few hours and then you can put it in your suitcase and get it back without having to worry about the uh, the oil causing a problem. This again is uh, in uh, Bermuda in the harbor. And I did little sketches with this, trying to get the lights just right. And uh, I had a residency down there for three months back in 2013. It was one of these things you apply for and they give you an apartment and a studio on Bermuda for three months. So you travel a lot? That was a work, yeah, yeah. I didn't think I was going to travel a lot, but I wound up traveling a lot. So I did a lot of work like that and setting things up um, in different locations, just dragging the easel with me. And I just used the old, the good old French easel, you know, the Julian, drag it around, stick all the paint in there, set it up, do a little something like this one. This was more like, I think this, you can kind of tell this is more on location. It's a little rougher looking. But, um, and then most of them I just dropped into a black frame so it wouldn't take away from the, the color that's in the painting being dark like that. This was, this is um, snow geese flying at night here. Yes, thank you, Joe. All right, see you later. So next we have Kyoko Miyabi. Hello, Kyoko. Hello, Mike. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this evening. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, hi. Um, so this wall uh, consists of um, works I created uh, in engaging with the poetry of Celia Bland, a poet 
is on this call. Um, she wrote a poem called um, Shooting Script, Brazen Jackson, season one, episode one through 13. Um, so it was in the form of a script for a TV show about Andrew Jackson and the Amino leader, Osceola. And I was invited to create a series of images to accompany her poems that were going to be published on a broadside that was published by the Greenkill Gallery in Kingston, New York. Uh, and in approaching um, this work, that was about a very dark chapter of American history. Um, I sought inspiration from the Japanese traditional no drama. And uh, in no drama, there is um, a stage and at the back of the stage is a panel with uh, an image of an old pine tree. It's always an old pine tree. And so I made um, some drawings of this image of the pine tree and um, and sort of combining the visual language that I had developed up to that point through various drawings and some of which you'll see later. So I made um, three drawings. Um, it was sort of a, a set and then um, tried to create paintings based on those drawings. And I often paint over old paintings that I never got to solve or finish. And recently, um, I've been thinking about patterns that I use often in my ink drawings and wondering if there's a way to make the patterns somehow a little more meaningful. And here what I saw inspiration was the Japanese traditional pattern. So this one you're looking at is based on the Seigai Ha pattern uh, directly translated as blue ocean um, wave. And it has this symbolic meaning of praying for world peace, which I think we need very much today. And um, and this one, the pattern uh, is uroko monyo, uh, meaning um, scale. So scale of uh, snakes or, or fish, but normally with snakes. So there is a symbolic meaning of warding off evil spirits. Uh, and another meaning of you know, protection. So those are the patterns I started incorporating my more recent work from the past couple of months. Kyoko, do you often paint from your ink drawings? Uh, that's something I've been doing the past maybe four, four or five years. Uh, up until that point, uh, I approached painting more spontaneously, didn't really have drawings or studies. Just, it was just my direct engagement with the canvas. It just started putting colors and shapes and being in dialogue with what was in front of me. But sometimes that's very difficult and it's hard to get stuck. And I, perhaps I was looking for a way to find a process that could be a little more generative without that struggle of, with the unknown. So this wall too um, started from a series of drawings I made for Celia's poem. This particular image was in response to a, a specific poem called Bird Bone, in which the speaker of the poem looks at a bird skeleton and thinks of escaping, flying away. So I made a lot of ink drawings, looking at images of bird skeleton and just really running with it and trying to be as imaginative as possible and challenging myself, well, how many variations could I 
possibly make. And it's similar to the earlier group of works, going back to some old paintings that I have not been able to finish and using those drawings to finally be able to finish some painting. So you're working in acrylic, yes? Yes, um, these are all acrylic paintings. I layer paint. I like to try and let some of the previous layers remain and show through the newer layers. So the work also becomes about literally accumulation of time and memory. So this wall is a um, group of works I created in response to, or I should say the starting point was a series of drawings Paul Clay made a few years before his death. Um, he died in 1940, and he made a lot of pencil drawings of angels. Uh, they're not necessarily the, the cute um, angels in Raphael's paintings, for instance, um, but more as figures residing in a realm between life and death. Paul Clay suffer from an incurable disease that hardened and tightened uh, skin and connective tissue. So I believe he had very limited um, motor skills at the end of his life. Um, so they're very simple drawings, but very beautiful and, and quirky and touching and um, so I made loose sketches based on those drawings uh, that Clay made. And then again, sort of taking it further and coming up with my own shapes. And I, I think it's also evolving from some of the bird bone drawings I'd made, the works you saw in the previous wall. So all these sort of visual language, vocabulary that I accumulated is coming synthesized with the drawings that I was now creating in response um, to Clay's drawings. Um, and then again here too, so using those drawings and using the shapes that I was able to come up with and going back to, uh, again, old paintings to create something new. So these are all, like the other paintings, it's all acrylic, and, um, lots of layerings, and it is mixed also with, in terms of colors, uh, they are more spontaneous uh, in trying to create some sense of unity uh, and tension within the pictorial surface. So this wall is also like the previous, not the, it's sort of uh, across from this wall, <laughs> uh, is that first group of bird bone paintings that I mentioned. So this is a um, continuation of that series of that group. This one was a little bit different too. I used stencils. I had cut out shapes um, that were based on shapes that were based on the drawings. Uh, and um, I never really took that approach further since then, but perhaps I should go back to it now that I'm looking at the painting. So this wall is um, group 
of drawings that accompanied Celia's collection of poetry called Cherokee Roadkill. And I made each drawing for a specific poem, not really illustrating the poem. I, I don't, I think that's very difficult, not impossible, but taking an element in the poem and creating a drawing of it. So how do you, did you like that collaborative process? Yes, very much, very much. Um, and so I've been really fortunate to be able to work with Celia on now two or three occasions. And I hope we'll have further collaborations in the future. And I'd like to invite uh, everyone, if you do get a chance to go to the gallery, um, those drawings, I hadn't looked at them for a few years. And when I took them out in thinking about what to put in for this show, I was very much struck by the physicality and materiality of the drawings, the way the ink bleeds into the paper surface. There's something very tactile that cannot be translated over screen or digital screen, similar to kind of what Joe was talking about, you know, the difficulty of photographing uh, these paintings of, of night. You really have to be there. And so if you do get a chance, uh, it'd be great to look closely at this. Thank you so much. Yes, we lose the, the subtlety, definitely, in the Zoom. But uh, thank you, Kyoko. And next we uh, come to Dora Fitcher. Hi, Dora. Hi, how are you? Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank Mike and Tina for hanging the shows. They all look wonderful. Um, so what I painted, you know, I, these are all new pieces that I made for this show and they are from my memories when I was a child, um, originally from Argentina, and we used to um, spend all the summers in Mar del Plata, which is a beach town in Argentina. My parent, my grandparents had a very big house where we all went, you know, my mom is one of four, so her brothers and sisters and their kids and so we used to spend the summers there and these are flowers. So these are memories and the passage of time. They had a big garden with lots of flowers and I love to paint flowers. Um, I work, the way I did these, I work with encaustic. If you're not familiar with encaustic, um, if you go to my website, there's one page that says what is encaustic paint. So I did these first with encaustic monotypes, which is a print. So I printed like the backgrounds and then I glued them on, um, on panels and then painted the flowers on top. So that's why you can see all the the lines in the back. And then I peeled away the wax so you can see the monotype um, that I had done, you know, when I went, I made the print. So these are how a lot of the flowers that are here were done. Um, but everything was done with encaustic. And then I finish them up with oil sticks and with pan pastels. So um, Sarah, encaustic yeah. is a heated wax, correct? Heated wax, With correct. pigment? With pigment. It's pigmented wax. You can buy it now in Kingston. Somebody said they lived or were in Kingston, um, New York. They have... Um, the first company, RNF, who started making the pigmented wax 
and they also make oil sticks. Now, these that we're going to see now are more of my memories of the sunrises. This one is a sunrise, the beach, the ocean. Um, these I did with encaustic, and then I did a shellac burn. So to do a shellac burn, I had learned to do shellac about eight years ago, but I could never get it right or you know, it would light up a lot, but then I learned a better way of doing it. So I started doing it again and I painted with shellac the parts. I can either use um, the amber shellac or it comes clear and I put pigment on it. And so I let it dry a little bit and then I use a uh, torch and I go around I use the torch like a brush and then, then it makes all those which is also hard to see on video would be it's much clearer you know if you see it in person um, you can see the shellac burns over here with the different colors and um, and in the background you see what I painted first and then I go over, I love to work in layers and I love to be able to see it. Some of them have, um, I have collage in there. I collage memories. So they're back in the background and that represents the, the passage of time, you know, as time goes by. This was the ocean and sunset. I can't remember the name of each one. But um, they're all my memories of the um, going to the beach, going to the ocean. And again, if you go to my website, I have a blog post which tells you about all the memories and where I, um, you know, about these paintings. This is the sand and the ocean again. And again, I used many materials. Um, most of them have encaustic and oil pigments, which are oil sticks and collage and, um, and pan pastels. I discovered pan pastels not too long ago maybe about a year during the pandemic and I just fell in love with them because they're like powder they're like makeup but you can you know use them with a little brush or I use my finger and make really wonderful things with it and what I like about the shellac it's how it gets on the top and then you know you see the layers underneath. Like this one, you can see music. I use a lot of, um, I use a lot of music in my painting. Some of them you see them, some of, you, some of them you don't. It was music that belonged to my dad. He was um, a musician. And he had a lot of music and I kept all his music. I used it for collage. This one was a monotype also. And I put that first, I glued it to a panel again and, and then built up from there. Tor, how long have you been working with encaustic and how did you discover it um i've been working with encaustic about 10 years i would say we're in uh, maybe a little more i just i saw something online you know i didn't know what encaustic was and i saw some work and i just fell in love with it i said i need to learn that i just love the look the texture the layers so I started looking in Philadelphia for somebody who could teach me that. And I found somebody who was teaching at Tyler and took classes with her. 
and um, and I haven't <laughs> stopped using it since. And I go back and try other, you know, uh, acrylics and this, but I just love, love the things that I can do with encaustic because I can carve, I can, um, you know, I can use the shellac, I can mix it with other mediums. It's, I love the smell of the wax. I just, I, I just love working with it. There's many things that I can do that I can do with other, maybe I could, I just don't know how to do with other. I used to work with oils mostly and, um, and acrylics, but, um, you know, I taught for many years, I taught children. And when I went back to painting, I started with oils until I discovered the um, encaustic. These are more poppies and flowers and my memories of my grandparents' garden in, in the house where we used to go in Mar del Plata. And I tend to always paint things that have to do with my childhood, my country, travels. I love bright things and uh, buildings and flowers and doors. And so that's mostly what my things, you know, the ocean, the sun, the um, sunsets. Anything else that you would like to know? It's beautiful. Thank you, Dora. Thank you. And uh, next we come to uh, Ronnie Bookbinder. Hi, Ronnie. Hi. Hi, Mike. Hi, everyone. Beautiful work. So happy to be in the, your company. Um, you can see this first painting was done at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, it sort of sets a tone for the rest of the work. It's, a, it's an urban scene um, with vibrant vibrancy. And uh, though it was a terrible time, I think for all of us, um, there's a sense of resilience that I see in that painting and that I uh, hope to carry through in, in the rest of the paintings. And that is that looking at perhaps humble settings, perhaps troubled settings, um, there, there was something in the world that we could um, examine and, and notice atmosphere and the beauty of some humble and maybe overlooked places. So here, this was a gas station. Um, uh, and yet I think the excitement of the motion around it um, and the colors that, that uh, were, uh, were used makes it an exciting uh, thing to look at. And again, here we see, um, I call, uh, that's the canal path. And you see the buildings and uh, the, the walkway. Um, they perhaps wouldn't be noted in general as beautiful, special places. And yet they have so much to offer when you look at the shapes and the colors. Um, and that's what I hope to do when I look at uh, different places. And that is to point out uh, their beauty uh, either their shapes or their colors or uh, their function and um, hope that because we're looking at them that they won't be overlooked. Um, on the two, these paintings you see snowy days um, and um, perhaps the lines and the colors uh, point to different shapes that I found very interesting. Um, I, I look at uh, Edward Hopper sometimes, and I think he's looking at buildings also that are perhaps, of so this, by the way, is a, an industrial scene. And um, 
perhaps not filled with the joyous colors of other places. Uh, and yet um, the power of what goes on there, I think, comes through. Um, again, another snowy scene um, with the snow melting and um, maybe the sun coming through. Uh, again, the shapes make, make it interesting to me. Um, here we have a building that uh, was uh, at the point of being taken down. And yet I thought it was such a beautiful building. Um, they did save some of these uh, uh, old panels from the building and used it and repurposed them. Um, this, is actually, this is an actual place. Sometimes uh, my paintings are uh, just imagined places. Uh, so these are all acrylics, Ronnie? These are all acrylics and some pencil, um, some acrylic uh, brush pens. Um, so uh, I, I often uh, look at these scenes and I can see um, a narrative that could uh, emerge from them. And I hope that when people see them, they, it stirs something in their imaginations that they either remember or that they, they have thought of. Um, this to me was another industrial type of uh, a scene. Um, and yet it mixed with nature and that really appealed to me. Uh, the way the uh, um, branches of the trees and the uh, uh, structures had similar construction that really appealed to me. And the way the natural world and the urban world mixed together is, is something that I think is very interesting and beautiful. And here, this is, this is, Perhaps some people would think a downtrodden neighborhood with the, with the uh, fence that it has, and yet it had so many beautiful shapes and, and um, moments in it. So are you working from reference material, like photographs or anything with well, Sometimes I start with a photograph or a place that I've seen. Um, I don't know if this one might look familiar to you because this is near the gallery. Um, yeah, I know that red. It's yeah. Our house. <laughs> yeah, but not this painting is not near the gallery. No, this is someplace further south. But and yet it's a moment where you could create a narrative, what was going on with these two women? Who were they? What were they doing? What were they doing there? I think it's interesting to um, stimulate one's imagination to see what, what might have happened or what will happen next. Now here you see the, the use of, uh, you saw earlier too, the use of the symbol of the bicycle, um, which I really love. I think it represents uh, freedom and joy. And um, so I, I've used it in a, a, a number of different ways and a number of different themes. Um, here again is a narrative. Uh, and you see that the bicycles are waiting, but I don't think it, they're waiting for those people, <laughs> but they're there. I imagine they perhaps were waiting for a bus, but they were never going to ride those bicycles. And then you see these bicycles um, piled up. Someone's busy somewhere. Uh, and probably will come out again and take a look at them and maybe use them. You know, in some some countries that I've been to, uh, the bicycles are just left and people exchange them. So 
this is a, one of the few collages that I included in, in the uh, collection. Um, and, you know, I think Dora was mentioning music. And to me, this, this particular collage um, has a musical note to it. And the next next few paintings um, have a bit to me of an um, abstract look, and I I enjoy um, looking at abstractions and uh, seeing how they fit into um, the, the various themes. And I think uh, all the circles and the wheels and everything going on. Just represent something joyous and free. It's sort of uh, at, as the pandemic has slowed down a bit. Um, I think that we're all experiencing some relief and and uh, joy in the ability, perhaps, to get around more and to be freer. And these two, this this painting, you can see the city in the background. Uh, perhaps just at sunrise. Um, I envision perhaps fountains there. This one I thought perhaps as the sun sets. Um, so are, these, are these abstract ones the most recent? Um, yeah, these, these three are the most recent. I seem to enjoy going, putting some abstractions and uh, some, sometimes there are abstractions in on an impressionist painting. Sometimes it, it's, it's uh, freeing to, to do abstractions entirely. In this one here, you see the, uh, the bicycles again, and yet this is much more impressionistic um along the water uh, just wonder where are the people what are they doing i like to begin a, a, an, a, an imaginative journey for people to wonder what's going on because it's the bicycles are not just by themselves but of course connected to people These paintings are um, a little bit more serious because that the one on the left, um, that I created that in response to what was happening in Ukraine. And um, so sad for the people, so desolate the areas. And um, I just wanted to feel a sensitivity towards their situation. Now again, Mike, are you recognizing this one? Because this is Watch Street. That's right near where you are. Uh, how about that? Yes. But I often, you know, don't tell people where uh, these urban landscapes are because I think um, they could represent any number of different places. And uh, so often people can connect there are these uh, scenes to places that they've seen or where they live. So I often don't mention that, but <laughs> I, I wanted to know if you recognized it. <laughs> <laughs> and this last painting, uh, oh, I forgot about these two. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, so the other, the two, two small ones, they're street views. So that one is in the parish. You can see the church in the distance. Again, a humble place, but with a great deal of beauty. And here, here of course, is the rooftops. I love the wires and the way they intertwine. 
And this last one I've included because I think it's the pathway into the city from the country. And you see the, I, I, my imaginary bridge on the left side. Um, it's, a, it's the beginning of the journey or the end, depending upon how you feel about the city. These are often places I've imagined or that I've actually visited. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Mike. So any uh, last questions for Ronnie or any of the other artists? Um, in that case, we'll end here. So thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. And uh, the show is up through November 6th, so hopefully you can come down and see it. And uh, hope you have a great night. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Great job. Beautiful. All right. I'll see you Saturday, Mike. Bye. 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 Bye.